Good afternoon, and you're welcome. My name is Alex White. I'm Director General here at the IIEA. The war in Gaza continues seemingly seemingly without end. Um, we're seeing nightly reports for many months of dreadful human suffering and really despair. Um, since the horrific events of the 7th of October, it's almost like as if shock has given way to a real sense of hopelessness um, across the world. Um, diplomacy, um, although active, seems to be delivering or to have delivered at least thus far very little by way of respite. Um, we saw the General Assembly um, last week a vote to grant new rights and privileges to Palestine and calling on the motion, calling on Secretary, uh, the Security Council to uh, reconsider Palestine's request to become the 194th member of the UN. Then here in Ireland, um, a close interest has been taken by the Irish government uh, in relation to um, in relation to the conflict, um, and along with Spain and others in Europe, um, there is a move to recognise the state of Palestine. And there was a confirmation in the Dáil uh, just yesterday um, that this is to happen on Ireland's part in any event um, by the end of the month. Um, because the story uh, and even the use of the word story seems to diminish what's happening because the conflict is is because the the news is what. We, we're, we're, we're aware of because it's overwhelming in so many ways. It's very hard to find space, and you see that even in, in the media, space for reasoned analysis, um, for engagement on the issues, perhaps by people with different perspectives, different experiences, different uh, proposals as to how, we, how this conflict could be resolved. And part of our role here at the IIEA uh, is to help inform the debate, certainly to help inform that debate here within Ireland, um, to deepen the level of understanding uh, of different positions, and to have, as I say, that opportunity um, for engagement and for interaction uh, by those who have uh, an understanding and experience of what's happening. So in that context, we are joined um, this afternoon by an impressive uh, panel uh, of experts. Uh, Marwan Washer is Vice President for Studies at the Carnegie Endowment of International Peace. Um, Raphael Cohen is Director of the Strategy and Doctrine Programme at RAND's Project Air Force in the US. And Dr. Rita Sacker is a professor here at Maynooth University. So what I'm going to do um, is, is to invite each of our three distinguished speakers to address you um, for perhaps five, seven minutes or so, and then we'll have an opportunity to go to a Q&A um, with our audience. You can join that Q&A in the normal way um, using the function uh, on Zoom, very familiar with that, um, I'm sure, and send questions in as they occur to you by all means through the session, throughout the session, if somebody says something you'd like to ask a question on, please pop that question into the Q&A uh, once it occurs to you. We like people to give us an indication of who they are, so your name and your designation, if you have one, if you're represented, and particularly if you're representing an organization, but even if you're not, uh, we just, if you would, please say who you are and uh, your designation or your organization, that'd be great. Um, today's presentations, contributions, and the Q&A all on the record. You can use X or Twitter if you still call it that, if you're motivated to do, to do so, and our handle is at IIEA. So I'm now going to uh, formally introduce our first speaker, Marwan Washer, um, is Vice President for Studies at Carnegie, where he oversees research in Washington and Beirut on the Middle East. Washer served as Jordan's Foreign Minister from 2002 until 2004, and Deputy Prime Minister from 2004 until 2005. In 1995, Washer opened Jordan's first embassy in Israel. From 07 to 2010, he was Senior Vice President of External Affairs at the World Bank. He's the author of The Arab Center, The Promise of Moderation, published by Yale in 2008, and The Second Arab Awakening and the Battle for Pluralism also published by Yale in 2014. So we're delighted to have you this afternoon and the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Alex. I'm going to keep my opening remarks short so we can respond to questions from the audience. 
Yesterday, the Israeli Prime Minister, Mr. Netanyahu, said in an interview with CNBC that a two-state solution is a reward for terrorism. You can imagine uh, the difficulty we're going to all have if we are seeking a political solution to the conflict with such positions. I am rather pessimistic about the day after Gaza in terms of arriving at a political solution. Crises in the Middle East before have led to political breakthroughs. The October 73 war led to peace between Egypt and Israel. The, the uh, first Gulf War led to the Madrid peace process. I'm afraid that this time the stars are not aligned. The U.S. administration is preoccupied with U.S. presidential elections. And it's very, very doubtful that President Biden is going to do anything serious on the peace process before the elections. And after the elections, who knows if he is still going to be in power. The Israeli government, I just said, has indicated publicly and repeatedly that they have no intention to end the occupation and no intention to help establish a Palestinian state. And the Palestinians today, the PA, have no credibility. Uh, all the polls suggest that close to 90% of Palestinians in the West Bank and Gaza want Abu Mazen out. And therefore, without Palestinian elections, it's going to be very difficult for any faction to say that they represent the Palestinians. For all these reasons, uh, the day after Gaza, at least in the short term, does not look very promising. In the past, most political processes have been open-ended. The end game has not been defined, and negotiations became, you know, negotiations over what the end game is, rather than on the root cause of the problem, in my view, which is the occupation and ending the occupation. If a political process, a serious political process, is to ensue after the day, uh, after the war on Gaza, then it has to have at least three elements. It first has to define the end game within a specified time frame, uh, and that should be the main, the main objective of any peace process, so that negotiations become over steps needed to reach that end game rather than on the end game itself. It has to recognize a Palestinian state on the basis of the sixty-seven borders a priori before even negotiations begin. This is not a new idea. The roadmap, which was not just developed, but also accepted by the international community 20 years ago, imagined a Palestinian state with interim borders with, uh, on the basis of the 67 border. And that has become very, very important. And in that regard, I think Ireland step to uh, potentially before the end of this month, recognize a Palestinian state alongside other European countries like uh, 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 Spain, uh, like Slovenia, like Malta, maybe even France, and of course, Sweden, which has already accepted a Palestinian state. These are very important moves because they would set a marker so that you know a reversal of this uh, does not uh, uh, that does not become easy. And the third uh, uh, step that needs to be taken is to stop settlement activity. We can no longer talk about two states while settlement activity goes on. That's like I often say, two people arguing over a slice of pizza while one of them is eating it. It doesn't work this way. We are either the international community is serious not only about a two-state solution, but about providing a credible plan to implement such a solution within a short and specified time frame. If that does not happen, then I'm afraid the alternative is going to be continued violence, both in Gaza and the West Bank for a you know, protracted period of time. Let me stop here and uh, listen to your comments. Thank you very much uh, for those opening remarks. I go to our um, second uh, distinguished um, guest, Raphael Cohen, is director of the Strategy and Doctrine Program at RAND's uh, Project Air Force in the in the US. 
Um, Rafe previously held research fellowships at the Brookings Institution, the American Enterprise Institute, and the National Defense University Center for Complex Operations, a military intelligence branched lieutenant colonel in the Army Reserve. Um, uh, Mr. Cohen has held a variety of command and staff positions in both the active and reserve components, including during two combat tours in Iraq from 2005 to 2006, and again from 2007 to 2008. He holds a PhD in government from Georgetown University. So over to you, um, Rafi, and the floor is yours. Well, You're thank welcome. you, Alex, and thank you so much for having me. I'm going to try to pick up a little bit of where Mullen left off and talk a little bit about the military dynamics of the conflict, particularly about the conflict in Gaza. We can talk, given that I know that there are Irish Defense Forces on the line, talk about the battle in the north along Lebanon uh, in Q&A, if you like. But I think it's really important to unpack those military dynamics of the war itself, if only because while we see the level of destruction, the tens of thousands of people who've been killed, you have to understand the logic of the war, if only because that's going to influence the ability or inability to get to a political settlement that Mohan mentioned. And I'd like to make sort of three big points here uh, for that I think help us understand why the war has played out this way and then what we can expect going forward and how we, we as the international community can ideally influence it. The first point I'd like to make is that when you think about Israel's war playing out, it's Operation Swords of Iron, as it's called, uh, it's better un it understood as sort of a response to shocks and a deliberate operation. This is a war that Israel never intended to fight. And the reason being is that when you go back to October 6, Israel's strategic assumptions was that Hamas was deterred, uh, thanks to the multiple different smaller Gaza wars, 2008, 2009, the 2011 campaign in 2014, most recently in 2021. They believed that Hamas was contained. Uh, Israel had invested a lot in a uh, border wall around Gaza, hailed as the most complex uh, wall ever, at least in uh, the Israeli press. And then, but I think importantly, they also thought that Hamas was appeased, which I think gets less attention, particularly in Western audience as well. And this is the fact is that uh, Israel uh, had allowed in Qatari money, about $100 million worth, worth um, and then allowed about 20,000 Gazan civilians to walk in Israel. Now, Netanyahu administration didn't do this out of largesse. The assumption is was that was going to sort of keep Hamas in check and keep sort of uh, Gaza on sort of a steady boil. Now, all of that proved to be dramatically wrong was October 7th. They, the Israelis, had anticipated that they may fight a sort of small brush fire war, but never sort of large scale war that they found themselves in. And that brings me to my second point, which is that when you think about what military operations look like in Gaza, is that they were always going to be very bloody and highly destructive, but Israeli choices may have probably made that worse. And the reason for that, it goes back to that my first point. Now, why is this, why is, uh, operations in Gaza are going to be bloody and highly destructive. That goes into sort of the dynamics of what the battlefield looks like. Um, Gaza, as we all well know, is one of the densest populated areas in the planet, unlike places like Fallujah, where the United States fought. Um, there's no real room for the civilians to displace, and that's a problem, um, particularly if you want to try to minimize civilian casualties. It's also true that Hamas was, at this point, is a very complex military organization. It has 30,000 odd members. For, con for context, that's about four times the size of the Irish Defense Forces, active duty strengths. It's a, and most of those are combat capable too. Uh, you have a tunnel network that's about 50% larger than the London underground system. All this makes it a very hard military problem. Now, and that in turn has led to some of the high level of destruction that we've seen play out. Now, where I think Israeli operations have fallen short, and where I think the you know, particular flaws in Israeli operations here is in two areas, particularly in the humanitarian area, and then thinking about the day after. And this gets, uh, and I think both of those relate back to that, my initial point, which is part of the reason uh, why the Israelis, or at least particularly the right of the Israeli political spectrum, have been so reluctant to let humanitarian aid into Gaza, is gets back to that belief that Hamas was appeased partly by sending in aid. And we can debate whether or not that was a 
good or what or right assumption, but that's I think partly what's shaping the strategic calculus there. And then the second point is the sort of failure by the Netanyahu administration to think about what comes next or an awful coherent plan gets in part towards that this is a sort of operation thought on the fly. And this brings me to my third big point here of like, where does the operations in Gaza stand today? And, you know, when you look just from a military angle of like where the operation is at present, you have Israel making gains on the tactical and operational level and a failure on the strategic level, which is, if you look at Israel's claimed gains, um, roughly half of Hamas's end strengths, its fighters, as they've claimed to have been killed in the fighting, um, it's hard to verify those numbers. A little bit easier to know is the sort of uh, particular damage to the sort of operational level wings of Hamas. Um, 100 or so platoon and company commanders, 24 battalion commanders, five brigade commanders and the like. Um, but, and then a handful of sort of senior level leaders, but all that you know, sort of tactical and operational gains and that being you to the, but on the strategic level, Hamas is still very much in control. Um, particularly in places like Rafa, where Israel believes there are four battalions there, um, but also increasingly sort of making gains in sort of reconsolidating, particularly in the northern half of the Gaza Strip. Now, what that means here, and this is brings me to my final final sort of summation point, and then I'll uh, conclude and hand it back off, is that when we think about what fighting looks like in Gaza after this, so after Rafa, um, Israel is not going to be able to destroy Hamas as a, as a military organization. There's going to be at least an insurgent presence inside the Gaza Strip. And what that means is that's going to cause significant problems for getting to that political solution that Balwan uh, laid out uh, in his opening remarks. The reason for that is as long as there's a residual Hamas military presence, Israel's going to have a reason to strike at that to preempt another October 7th. It's going to make it also hard for the Palestinian Authority and the Palestinian security forces to try to assert control over the Gaza Strip. And it's going to make the rebuilding effort in Gaza that much more difficult. And I think if we want to think about where the international community can try to shape this to get to, to uh, Gaza to a better place, we have to wrestle with those very complex security dynamics. So with that, I'll uh, turn it back over to you, Alex. Thank you very much, um, and uh, appreciate um, appreciate those opening remarks. And just to remind our audience, if you'd like to ask a question, um, pop a question into the Q and A function there on Zoom, um, and you can do that at all points um, during the discussion. And as soon as something occurs to you and you feel strongly enough to want to pose that question, you can you can do so. So feel free. Dr. Rita Sacker is an assistant professor at Munich University in postcolonial and global literatures. Previously, uh, Professor Sacker worked as a lecturer in world literature in Goldsmiths in London and, well, and is, uh, as I said, now in Munich University. She's co-chair there of the Sanctuary Committee and is also a co-founder of the Irish Network of Middle Eastern and North African Studies. So, Rita, the floor is yours. Thank you for joining us. Thank you very much, Alex, and oh, thank you for having me here. Um, I am going to build on what Raphael called flaws and failure, and Marwan uh, talked about also the day after, but in a different way. Um, so my opening remarks are really inspired by two many images that I have been thinking about a lot. Uh, the first is the recent photo of the Israeli ambassador shredding a copy of the UN Charter ahead of 143 world nations voting to grant new rights and privileges to Palestine. And there's a second image, and it's a much earlier image from the Irish Times, and in that uh, November footage, it was a video, a deeply traumatized Palestinian child talks about the horrifying experience of having to carry a decapitated body after an Israeli strike on the Jabalia camp. So those two images make me think of Gaza inevitably in terms of and in relation to also severing. So I'm going to start with the idea of Gaza as a severing. 
and unpack that in the opening remarks. A severing of over 360 square kilometers of life from what should have been an integral Palestinian state where all Palestinians thrive in dignity. Or we can think of it alternatively and say a severing of 360 kilometers of life from a one state vision that brings Muslim, Christian and Jewish, Arabs and non-Arabs together. So I'm using the term life intentionally here because of what has been inflicted on uh, not only human beings, but also their homes, their livestock and their pets, their trees and their water, the sky and the sea in Gaza. So Gaza has also been the victim of severing within a wider acknowledgement of harm inflicted by the Israeli state on Palestinians. We have international sanctions tentatively placed on some violent settlers in the occupied West Bank and East Jerusalem, but sanctions are not placed on a political and military entity committing genocide in Gaza. Gaza is severed from international humanitarian law, from human rights declarations, from UN conventions and resolutions, and the list goes on. So continuing with Gaza being severed, it's severed from the common sense understanding that it is impossible to establish safe zones within a completely besieged, starved, bombarded, and invaded strip like Rafah. In so-called leading democracies, Gaza is severed from the right to protest, from the recognition of its rightful place in feminist and anti-racist activism, from equality, diversity, and inclusion principles. But in Gaza, most importantly, I think we have to remember that the limbs of women, men, and children are severed. The houses, the bakeries, the hospitals, schools, universities, books, and toys are torn into shreds. And in Israeli prisons, the tied hands of Gazan detainees are amputated. So if this continues, Gaza and Gazans are severed from any viable future of dignified life, any life, any day after. But probably we have to ask who is doing the severing and what remains after the severing. Of course, the obvious, the Israeli government and the Israeli army are the ones who are directly committing the harm that severs life in Gaza. But multiple governments, organizations, and institutions are enabling the severing in one way or another. So for example, when a politician in Lebanon remembers rightly the genocide of Armenians, but then warns that the Lebanese have nothing to do with what he calls the war between Israel and Hamas, they are committing severing. When a cultural organization that supposedly fights against disinformation refers to loss of Palestinian lives, but the killing of Israelis, they are committing severing in language. And that has major implications for the cultural organization itself, but it also has, very importantly, real-life consequences for all Palestinians. And when a university in the United States or anywhere else in the world proclaims their commitments to freedom of expression, to human rights, to EDI principles, but either violently suppresses a student protest that is calling for ceasefire and justice, or does not really itself call for ceasefire and justice, the university or any other similar institution is committing severing from their obligations. And when world powers turn a blind eye to war crimes perpetrated through AI-powered weapons systems with names like Gospel, like Lavender, like Where is Daddy, that annihilate entire families, these powers are committing severing, not only from ethical commitments with respect to the future of AI, but I think more importantly here, they are committing severing from every lesson learned across humanity's long history of violence, and they are endangering the future in every possible way. So finally, I'm asking what remains after all this severing and how to reconnect those severed parts. Just briefly, I think what remains ironically are the two images that I started with, the Israeli ambassador shredding international law and the Palestinian child carrying the remains of shredded lives. To reconnect those severed parts may require a simple recognition of common humanity, of what one should do or would do if this happened to their family, their homes, their hospitals, schools, their universities, the books and toys of their children. It's also a commonsensical recognition of what kind of precedent this denial, silence, and complicity set in the 21st century. And this is not only for the MENA region, not only for you know, the 
surrounding countries and for Palestine and Israel, but rather for the whole world. And we know that since both compassion and common sense are rare among the powerful, I think it will be the beaten student protesters and the Jewish professors of genocide studies, those who belong to the unions that boycott and the flotillas that will sail towards Gaza who will reconnect the parts. Thank you. Thank you.